this happened to me last year. I'm not proud of what I did, and for the sake of my safety and protecting my identity, I'll be referring to myself as Jane and the male in this story, John. Now for context, I'm a single and bigger girl, and at this point in my life, I was in a dark place. I was alone, depressed, and being unattractive and desirable in my eyes, I wanted something meaningless to make me feel better. One day, John had started complimenting me at work, and I took it. He was 15 years older than me, and I really fell for the comments and flattery. It then turned into messaging and pictures on a dirty level, and it escalated into physical intimacy and touching. Now, we were both single, so in my mind we weren't really doing anything wrong, and we didn't have feelings for each other. It was just for simple pleasure. That's it. I didn't want anything more, and neither did he. So, I'll skip the details, but things were done in the office and in the car park, and then two occasions out of sight in his car. It took one thing I did to make me feel disgusted, and then I realized that I had enough and wanted out, which he was happy to agree with. We then eventually went back to normal at work, and everything was fine. However, I was due to go away on a holiday for about a week, which was booked prior to all of this. So, I was really ready for my break. But during this time, John kept messaging me and saying how he missed what we had, and he asked if he did anything for me anymore, to which I replied no. I was starting to get pissed off as we agreed when it began that if we wanted to walk away, we could without getting hurt. We never slept together, we just did other things. But his messages were getting more constant, and I told him point blank that he needed to stop because I'll never give him what he wants again. It was wrong, and I didn't like who I was becoming by being a part of this. John quieted down after this message, and he went radio silent. Flash forward to when I returned to work and John was acting normal, and I thought it was the end of it. But I was wrong. Due to us working in the same team, we were asked to work together to build this report regarding some figures or whatever. I can't really remember the details honestly, but it required us to work together. Now, I had no problem with this, and the first two meetings went fine. All work and no play and all that. It was then when I went to my manager about the report, and she told me that John had specifically asked for me to be partnered up with him rather than my other colleague. I thought this was strange, but I put it down to the fact that I was more experienced than my colleague was. So one night, due to other meetings, John had put our last sit down in for 4pm for 2 hours. I finished at 5pm, but I was actually off the next day, so I accepted. The meeting went well, and we finally did the report to the point of satisfaction to hand it to the directors, which John was going to do the very next day. We tidied up and then headed out of the building to the car park. It was pitch black and very cold, so we had walked fast to the car park, which at the time was empty. We then said our goodbyes, but as I had turned to get into my car, I then felt arms grab me and I was pushed into the back of John's car. And before I could do anything back, John was now on top of me holding a knife up to my throat. He had slammed the door behind us and got in my face while straddling me. He told me that he planned this so that he could have me once and for all, and if I struggled, he would kill me. I was frozen. I was shocked at the turn of events, and I asked him why he would do this. He then told me that he was obsessed with me, and he was pissed off when I ended it, so he had forced us to work together so I'd let my guard down and he would do this. I begged him to stop, but he just pressed the knife closer to my throat, telling me to shut my mouth. He had then proceeded to take off my clothes, but just as he was about to do that, the door then swung open, and to his shock, he was pulled off of me, dropping the knife. I had breathed a sigh of relief. That's when I then got out of the car from the other side, and then ran around to see John now being pinned to the ground by my other co-worker. We'll refer to him as Jake. Jake had seen the whole thing go down from his van and he had called the police, then intervened himself, and in doing so, saved my life. The police came and took John away while I explained the whole situation to them. I later came to find out that Jake was asked to head back to the office to check out a vehicle that was in an accident earlier that day, and that's why he was in the area. John was arrested and charged. 
It eventually got out what had happened throughout the whole workforce. The details were made about what we did. I don't know how, but I just couldn't take the looks of shame in my work, so I ended up quitting and left. Jake was actually in a similar situation to me years prior himself, and he understood what I was going through. Me and Jake actually ended up dating shortly after. John is currently in jail for assault, and I think every day for Jake being there because if he wasn't, I really fear where I would be now. But I was in a really bad place back then, and John took advantage of that. I do take responsibility for my part in all this, but I did not deserve to be assaulted. I really thought we were on the same page, but clearly we weren't. But I'm now happy, and I'm moving on with Jake. I have no plans to ever see John again, and I really hope I never do. All names will be changed to remain anonymous. Back in 2015, I was working in food service, specifically as a supervisor for a coffee shop. Pretty soon in my actual training, the manager at the time decided she was going to leave and then open up her own coffee shop. She had hired maybe three to four people before leaving so that we wouldn't, in her words, be short-staffed. In doing this, she really wasn't as careful as she was before about who she was hiring. Which brings me to my work nightmare. Tony will be his name in this story. Tony seemed nice, at first. He was probably in his early 20s, average height and thin build. I was a short 23 year old who was living as a stealth male and I was also transitioning from female to male. At this point, I almost have all of my surgeries and I've been on hormones for three years. So there was truly no questioning, but people didn't know unless they were told. My coworkers were all well aware of this because they had all been there for most of my surgeries. Tony was not very good at his job. He was struggling to pick it up and he was really stressing everybody out. I always tried to be nice to him though, because I know how hard learning all of that could be, and that's just my general personality. One night while I was sitting at the bar with my dad and my best friend enjoying a drink before a lacrosse game, I had got a Facebook message request. I skimmed through the profile of someone named Riley for a brief minute, and then opened the message. It seemed normal. It consisted of a standard greeting, a simple, hi, how are you? And then it turned very dark very quickly when I asked who they were. It was obvious it was a fake account, so I didn't really expect anything other than to be trolled. That was until they said they knew who I was and where I worked, which was not out of the ordinary as a lot of our regulars were super friendly with me. So much so that they would give me gifts before my surgeries. But this was certainly not a regular. As I opened up the new message after hearing the familiar ding and feeling the phone vibration, I was horrified. It was a slew of messages threatening to throw hot coffee on my face, beat me up at work, and many more awful things. The messages taunted me saying that I couldn't prepare for it because I had no idea who they were so I wouldn't know who to look out for. Now, I know that doesn't sound too scary, but let me set the scene here. I worked at a kiosk in the mall. Everything around me was open, as well as the back of the kiosk being wide open to a seating area for us and a staircase leading to and from upstairs. There was very little protection. When the mall and the police came together and did drills for active shooters, we would have to go hide in the other stores or hope that we could make it to the back room which was down a dark, barely lit hallway that was not as populated as you would think. A few days passed from getting the first message request, and I'm still getting these messages but not answering as much, if at all sometimes, hoping that if they didn't get the responses they wanted, they would just leave me alone. But then they said something one day after a week. It was something that keyed me in on the fact that it was Tony. Tony had made a comment about how I was not a real man, and that while I was going down the hall to the back room at night, they were going to teach me a lesson. And that threat? That threat involved sexually assaulting me and that no one could help me. I was horrified. At this point, most of my coworkers knew a little bit about what was going on. Enough that they were all worried and protective over me, 
which made the kiosk very tense, especially because everyone agreed it was Tony. Our manager refused to listen to us, but said that he would put us on separate shifts. My brother went and bought me a keychain with mace, which you have to travel outside of where we live to a state of three hours over to even purchase. I had added it to my keys for work, and my ex-boyfriend at the time also made sure that I had a small wooden baseball bat in my car at all times. Whenever I would go on break, whether Tony was working or not, especially when he wasn't, all of my coworkers would keep looking out for all the open spots of the kiosk just to make sure I was okay. I remember vividly one time one of my shyest coworkers had peered over the kiosk and couldn't see where I was sitting, and then quickly ran out and panicked. The messages continued with threats, and eventually we had hit a breaking point. One day we were slammed with customers and Tony was working. Most of the customers were being really polite about the wait, and with Tony not being great at his job, I had tossed him on the register. We had two of them, so he wasn't working alone. I was supporting my staff by filling up the ice bins and getting things that they were low and out of, when suddenly a coworker then walked up. They were pale and looked flustered. I was told that a customer wanted to speak to the person in charge, so I had stepped out of the kiosk, took off my apron, and then approached the woman away from everyone else. The woman told me that she didn't want to get anyone in trouble, and by that sentence alone, I knew it would be bad, but I could have never imagined what she would tell me next. She proceeds to tell me that not only was Tony rude when she told him that he gave her the wrong food item and complained that her drink order was too crazy, but then he told her it was her fault because she sounded like she had a dick in her mouth. At this point, this poor lady was actually holding back tears. She told me that she was already self-conscious about her voice because she had beat cancer and she was left with her voice changed forever from it. I wish I could have seen my own face because I was mortified. I quickly began apologizing and I had asked her to wait around for a moment while I called our manager in HR. I had asked a coworker to run the floor for a moment and Tony had to go do some back of the house work like cleaning the milk fridge. Once Tony walked away, I filled four recovery carts and also refunded the woman's order while calling the manager. The customer left telling me that I didn't have to do all that and that I made the situation right by just being kind. A day passed and Tony was given a final warning and I would absolutely dread having to work with him, knowing during launch week I had no choice. One night after a few really disgusting messages from Riley, I purposely said something that I figured would make Tony finally admit it was him, and sure enough, it did, but not how I was planning. I had came in for my shift the next day, and the manager had asked to have a meeting with me. I walked into the back room with another supervisor who was also asked to be there, and who was there? Tony. Turns out, Tony claimed that I was saying racist things to him, and without me having proof, I was given a warning. That's when Tony turned around and specifically mentioned how over Facebook I had called him a sexual predator, which I only said to Riley. I looked at Tony and then yelled, See? I knew it was you! He then tried to turn it around and said that it was his friends, and that was the icing on the cake. My manager finally had something to prove that he was the one messaging me. He was fired that day on the spot. Work felt a lot less stressful now, but we were all still pretty worried because now he was really angry at me. My manager reached down to the mall security, and that's when we found out the most amusing news. Something that the original manager should have found out earlier on when she hired Tony. Tony was apparently banned from the mall a whole year prior. He wasn't even supposed to be in the mall at all. After a little bit of time passed, he was no longer able to come to the mall, and work finally became enjoyable again. Wherever Tony is, I really hope he got some help. Hey everyone, I'm going to go by Jay for privacy reasons. A little background on me is that I'm a CNA, and I worked in an assistant living facility in the PNW. I had started working there in the spring of 2023, and I absolutely love my job. The job can be taxing both physically and mentally, 
but the residents really make it all worth it for me. Anyone who has a similar job to me knows that the job can also be emotionally taxing too. Recently, I had a resident pass away completely out of the blue. I had to take a day off, and when I came back, I was notified of her passing. I was so stunned, and I actually didn't even believe my coworker at first. My coworker told me, Yeah, Kay passed away yesterday. All I could do was look for her and then say, Wait, what? My coworker took me to Kay's room to then show me that she was no longer in there. And that's when it finally hit me. Her bed was empty, but all of her things were still in her room. My coworker told me that Kay had been doing fine and that she had even gotten out of her bed the day before she passed. Kay was bedbound, and unfortunately, other staff hardly even bothered to try and get Kay in her wheelchair. My coworker had told me that on my day off, Kay had a spiked fever and that she went downhill extremely quickly. I was devastated by the loss of Kay, but sadly, life has to continue on. I was working at the same building a few days later when something very odd happened. All of our residents have call pendants, but the system is usually malfunctioning or just down altogether. To help out when the call system was down, the higher-ups had this genius idea to put bells in the residents' rooms, like the ones that you see on customer service desks that ding when you need assistance. Well, I work NOC shifts, and I was in the kitchen area filling up paperwork. I was closest to the hallway where Kay's old room was, when I had then heard something that made my heart jump to my throat. I heard what sounded like a death rattle, but it was so loud that it felt like it was coming from inside my own head. Then, after the noise subsided, I had heard a single ding of a bell. I knew that it was coming from the hallway where Kay's old room was, but I also knew the two other residents in that hall were not physically able to ring their own bells. So I ran all the way around my building just to make sure that it wasn't another resident. But of course, everyone was asleep. I finally decided to peek into Kay's old room because I wasn't even sure if she even had a bell in there. Sure enough, when I opened the door and looked in, I saw a bell sitting alone on the bedside table. After I saw that, I just closed the door and tried getting my breathing back to normal. Surprisingly enough, I wasn't too scared by this whole experience, and I like to think that it was Kay saying goodbye to me since I wasn't working the day that she passed. This is just one of the stories that I have about this facility. There have been a lot of deaths within those walls, and sometimes people hang around. Thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to my story, and please stay safe out there. To preface this story, this is 100% real, and it's something that happened back when I worked in healthcare in a long-term care home. The building I worked at housed both palliative and dementia residents. We had three units referred to as North Wing, South Wing, and Dementia. North and South made up an L-shape with the dining room right in the middle connecting them. Palliative was through doors usually kept locked at the end of North, attaching it to like the top of a T. I worked the night shift. We were a skeleton crew, a single nurse and two healthcare aides. Yours truly included in the latter. If someone needed us at night, we were there, usually because nights went by quite slowly. We did the day shift and evening shifts extra charting in the dining room. From there, we could hear anyone that called out and respond to any alarms that went off. The nurse Barb and I were sitting at a table tapping away on our iPads and chatting. My fellow healthcare aide had gone into South to put a man who usually forgot the time back to bed. Suddenly, I had heard a faint call from somewhere in North, maybe palliative. Barb heard it too. We had always carried our phones on us during the night shift so we didn't have to ring alarms and wake up residents. I told Barb that I'd check it out and text her if I needed her, but just to continue doing the charting. Besides, it was something that happened every single night. I walked down north, poking my head into each room as I went to see if anyone was awake and to try and find the source of the call. All along the way, I was met with sleeping bodies. As I hid palliative, I felt like a stone had settled in the back of my throat. 
I had debated texting Barb, but I knew that she'd end up teasing me about being scared of the dark, so I marched on, typing in the passcode and going through the heavy doors. As soon as they clicked shut behind me, I had heard another cry to my left, a woman's voice saying, help me. I quickly went through each of the rooms until I was standing at the end of the hallway in the dementia dining room, totally confused. No one was awake. All of the grandmas were asleep on that end. Again, now louder, I heard the cry and almost sounded like a very angry person screaming for help. And it was from the opposite end of the unit. I ran across checking in all rooms. Again, as I entered the final room, not a single resident was awake. Not even the men who I had doubts would be able to sound like the voice that I had heard. I left the final room, about to check them all again now closer. Perhaps one was having a nightmare. As I stepped foot out of the room, I froze, a chill running up my spine. Outside of the last room, there was a small living area with a couch, table, and some chairs. Due to the unit being for dementia residents, all the furniture was weighed down underneath with massive concrete blocks to prevent the residents from moving them and hurting themselves. It took over four men to move the couch on cleaning days. Every chair over 50 pounds each and said 200 pound couch had turned and it was facing the room that I came from. All turned and facing me. There was no possible way four people, let alone Barb and my fellow HCA, could have moved that couch not only in the short amount of time I was in that room, but also without making a single noise. The floors bared scratch marks from the numerous times that we had been forced to move it around from before. I ran. I ran to the doors, ignoring the multiple cries of, Help me! Please help me! that followed, biting at my heels. It took me three attempts to get the password in right. I then ran down north to where Barb had started to come look for me. Her and my fellow co-worker went to go check on the unit after I told them what happened and then returned with pale faces. They knew that I couldn't have moved that couch. From that night on, we had never checked on a call alone. I still have no idea what happened. Many people have died in that home. I really hope that they've all eventually found peace. I want to mention again that this story is not fiction. This happened to me, and it wasn't the only scary thing to happen on a night shift. Working in a place where people go to die, I now have a healthy respect for those who may have not moved on peacefully.